Yeah, so I uh, led the uh, Establishment of Epidemic Management Unit and Program of Work at WHO the last three years as part of the Emergency Preparedness and Response Program. Um, but I'm not uh, representing WHO uh, today um, uh, since I've left it a couple of weeks ago. But what I'll actually talk about is um, a synthesis of actually a very, very, very tiny slice of the work that uh, we had done um, together with uh, global uh, research uh, practitioner partner and, and other partners. Um, um, so some of the lessons learned, because I was asked to present specifically on social listening inside of, a, of an AI and other tools talk. Um, I, I actually would like to, as, as a, uh, and I know that it, I'm the last talk here, so maybe I'll give you the punchline ahead of time. What I want to convince you in the next 25 minutes or so is that um, information environment is really the uh, one big challenge that public health, not only immunization programs, but public health and health systems are increasingly bumping against. Uh, when they're trying to actually, when we're trying to effectively um, uh, uh, achieve and advocate for um, better health outcomes and well-being um, in people that we serve. Um, however, uh, so we, while we do need to actually adopt a lot of the different techniques from commercial marketing, from OSINT, so the um, uh, open uh, intelligence from open source uh, uh, sources, uh, from um, a, a lot of the different tools, including computer science. Uh, there's actually something that's missing, um, which is, um, or that we need to really pay attention to, which is how does one actually frame and approach the challenges that we're facing uh, in public health from the information environment with public health approaches. Uh, otherwise, we might actually be missing a lot of the, um, the utility of those tools into our work. So I've been asked to speak about social listening, but actually I'd like to also, I would like to actually first start by talking about the information environment and what this is, because some of these concepts matter. Like we've been talking the whole day and referring to certain, uh, certain topics, and, and, uh, but actually I think it's important to uh, put a little bit of, uh, of an emphasis on this. At the beginning of the pandemic, so this is an illustration from about early 2021, um, we really had this um, uh, a perception that basically whatever is happening to us on social media, it's being done to us. Um, it's, it's basically something that we're just uh, being exposed to, but what we, and, and most of the time, this means that we uh, assume that the information environment is really most importantly about the producers and the amplifiers of the pieces of content. And maybe if we're, uh, depending on who we talk to, we talk about design environment, algorithms, etc. We heard a little bit, um, uh, even during today, that actually um, what uh, can drive behaviors are social norms, relationships, interactions. In our information environment, this is very much the case, there's also the dimension of skills, resilience, uh, and literacies related to how people search to feel about information, how they understand it and how they act on it. And huge, there's a huge aspect uh, of inequities here. Now, why am I saying this is because um, we still tend to think about the information environment, even though we're trying to parse it, we're still actually thinking about it in broadcast mode of old fashioned media where as long as we flood the information space, as long as we're thinking about only the volume, that's literally, and as long as we kind of counteracted and counter flooded with good information, everything is gonna be, uh, we're gonna be fighting and, uh, or competing with the misinformation um, well. But actually not all information that is circulating uh, in the information environment is created equal. It does not, uh, it's not produced uh, or amplified or act and acted uh, on equally. And when you think about, so you know, I'll try to bring you into public health frameworks because ultimately what we're trying to do as public health professionals inform a health authority, a health department to take action. We have a certain mandate 
certain tools and then certain partnerships outside of the health sector that we can build. But ultimately, uh, there's um, uh, the way that we make decisions, the way that we serve um, different populations uh, has, uh, has, uh, has uh, a certain way of, of thinking. And uh, those of you who work in health promotion or social determinants of health, this is a very common uh, uh, graphic that basically shows what is the relative contributions of different determinants of, uh, to, uh, of health to health outcomes. And on the bottom, you'll see health behaviors and social economic environment as predominant contributors to this. Um, what I would actually argue um, is that the modern information environment, especially the last 10, 15 years, um, actually directly or indirectly impact all of these. We just haven't gotten a grip on it to research it, to have all of the evidence that we could put into an evidence gap map to actually give you a basic recipe of this, 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 this you need to do. But we see from practice that this is the case. And I would say that an unmanaged information environment can really uh, impact not only adherence to health guidance. Uh, so I was working in an emergency setting, but basically any health guidance. Um, and it can lead to adverse social behavioral and, and health outcomes. It's a serious thing. And we do need to recognize it that for health systems, this actually requires quite a very different way of thinking. Um, uh, there's different ways of, of looking at harms uh, from information environment. But the reason why I like to present it in these three buckets is because this is literally what a Minister of Health and, and the health system are, uh, are, uh, uh, has in order to be able to, um, to uh, promote health, to deliver care, um, and, uh, and uh, achieve better, better population uh, health and well-being. The information environment really intersects with health system in three, in three parts. The, uh, on the level of health system, um, and I'm, talking, I'm not talking about misinformation only, I'm talking about all the different information questions, concerns that you also uh, heard other speakers refer to, um, uh, impacting downstream uh, demand for different services, for different uh, programs, We've seen, for example, during COVID-19, stockouts of certain uh, drugs, like in the US, ivermectin, but there's other examples. Um, and at the level of health system, since we're talking about trust, and I'll speak about trust tomorrow as well, um, trust in policies and governance related to the healthcare uh, supply, service delivery, et cetera. This is very familiar uh, to, uh, to immunization programs because that is one of the uh, one of the uh, boxes in the uh, behavioral social drivers of, of vaccination. But it also impacts health workers. These are the people, the most trusted people that actually um, are sources of health information for any program, not only immunization. And it, it actually has two effects. And this is something that during the last three years we've been emphasizing quite a lot. Uh, not only does it affect how people perceive health workers, and that can lead to a serious violence um, against uh, health workers and health facilities, but actually it impacts health worker own confidence um, in, uh, in the products and services that they are using and that they're advocating and promoting for. So we really need to be um, more, uh, we need to uh, uh, address uh, the impact on health workers in a much more holistic way um, um, and not only see them as the delivery or a part of a capacity of the health system to deliver the, the program and the services that, for example, a, a particular health program has, uh, has the mandate to do. And then, of course, uh, the information environment also impacts health behaviors. I intentionally, and I know that there's behavioral scientists in the room, but I intentionally bunched this uh, um, the added, the trust and acceptability of different products, so um, uh, devices, diagnostics, treatments, vaccines, uh, and the trust and acceptability and recommended health behaviors and health guidance. Um, uh, I, I put this together, and I think I'll, I'll explain this to tomorrow a little bit more. But obviously, the the information environment can really affect also the risk perceptions at any one time also changes 
and that challenges the the ability to work social cohesion linked to trust in others and in society really big uh big issue it's also something that we need to be thinking about so a lot of the um interventions and a lot of the strategies that we think about about information environment normally f fall into the yellow and the orange here so what i'm showing you here is well how would you think about um, a health authority a health department what are the things that they would need to think about when they're trying to figure out how does health information flow through the information environment of the populations that they're serving, interacting, and working on? And most of the time, traditionally, it's the communications uh, approaches that are emphasized, which means that we emphasize creation and dissemination of credible, accurate health information. And if we are thinking about health information equity, we're thinking then in adapting and tailoring different contexts to different populations uh, based, on, uh, based on different, uh, different uh, factors. But actually, um, that's not good enough. What we've seen is that the reason why information environment challenges us so much is because we actually need to be aware of commercial determinants of health information. So Liz's question kind of alluded to this. Um, there's private interest in how the information environment is built, designed, and we, and we uh, in public health don't have direct control over it. But we do have the responsibility to understand the, the differences in how um, platforms are built and for what purpose, so that we can actually work and partner and leverage and use these platforms, um, basically work with what we have. Um, uh, content moderation policies is one example that um, we actually do have a little bit of influence over. But as Liz pointed out, um, uh, the, there's huge asymmetry in investment into basically English language content moderation of, co of content online, which means that all of the other, uh, the rest of the world, especially if they're speaking different languages, basically have no safeguards in place for any type of um, even basic things that perhaps we, when we are interacting in English language, uh, uh, are exposed to. There's another issue in commercial determinants of health, um, deceptive marketing practices. These are not new. Uh, they're very common, very well documented on how the platforms and the safeguards that even exist are manipulated for promotion of uh, uh, herbal medicines alternatives, uh, alternative treatments, and things like this. And, this, and the lastly, a um, huge part of the commercial determinants of health information is also being aware that when we collaborate with the platforms on research, they can actually use the trace data to profile exactly what their user base thinks and does about health products, uh, health services, and um, different facets of health. What does that mean? they literally are able to facilitate and sell this through their services later on in, uh, in, their, um, in, their, uh, in their business. So we also have a responsibility as um, health departments, ministries of health, etc., to have very clear policies of when should we engage and in what way, in what kind of research, and also for what kind of benefit when we're actually uh, working with, uh, with, with the platforms. We do need to have a constructive relationship, but, uh, but uh, especially during the last uh, three to five years, I think we've actually been quite weak in leveraging what the trusted role of a government and a health authority really is uh, versus um, what the platforms provide in exchange uh, when we actually do this. There's also the piece on digital inform information science and health literacy but, uh, and policy, but I'll skip this. All of this is actually extensively, uh, I've written about this on my, on my blogs online. But let's switch over to the information environment. And I'd like to build the case for you that we actually need much, much, much better evidence to support any health program, <laughs> including immunization programs, to um, address the challenges from the information environment. I think to most of you, this, this figure is not, uh, not new. Uh, basically shows the, 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 the typical um, evolution uh, or maturation of, a, of an immunization program in a country. And I marked basically down on the bottom the, the three times where normally 
communication uh, investment is made um, in, uh, uh, in in the immunization program. Uh, so just uh, at the introduction of the vaccine, mass awareness campaigns, when there's a dip in, um, in coverage um, that causes an outbreak and there's, there's a reactive response. And then towards the end in the last mile uh, efforts towards eradication and elimination. But um, I would actually argue that um, if we don't routinize um, uh, collection of information and insights specifically on how information environment dynamics are challenging us not just with misinformation but also questions, concerns, narratives. If we do not routinize this to the same extent that we've routinized all of the other epidemiological and microbiological surveillance, we will be uh, actually paying much more over time uh, for the efforts towards eradication. Of, uh, of disease than, than um, if we routinized, um, invested in health system capacity, uh, immunization program capacity, but also health promotion capacity to do this and do this well. And I'll show you later what this might uh, actually look like. Now the added challenge is that we don't, what we also don't um, think about very often when we speak about digital uh, platforms is that questions, concerns, information voice and narratives they change constantly in the information environment. And normally, the health authorities are uh, um, too slow, not just to detect them, but to then react. And uh, this, especially during an acute health event, which I'll speak tomorrow about tomorrow, is really, really important. So um, uh, at WHO, um, they published um, this um, basically a public health uh, framework, public health informed framework on how one could uh, be managing infodemics. It starts with evidence generation and it's cyclical, uh, design intervention, tested, learn from it, continuous. Um, the crux here is actually that it has to be fast and I'll, I'll show you some examples for it. But before we get there, when we talk about information environment and analyzing people's information behaviors, um, we actually make a lot of assumptions that aren't really compatible with um, being actionable and informing public health action. So really, uh, and I'll give you some examples here of um, our evidence is only gonna be as good as our questions that we ask, the type of methods and analytics tools that we use um, and, and how we actually translate that. So um, because a lot of the research uh, about the information environment, misinformation, narratives, comes from uh, especially elections and democracy research, um, things that might be work and more can su be sufficient as far as metrics and measurement in one-off election campaign where all you care about is how many people made, you know, um, uh, how many people actually were exposed to a particular piece of misinformation? Did they actually go to vote? The election campaign is maybe three, four months, and then you forget about it and you go home. In health, this is not the case. So also our metrics need to be, um, it, it, it's not actionable for me to be counting and telling my, uh, my colleagues um, um, in the immunization program, okay, how many pieces of misinformation did you actually detect? Or how are people talking about acronyms like AFI or something like that? No one on, online actually talks about this. But tools that we have available are designed specifically for this. So unless we actually adapt the way that we use computational tools for, um, uh, in, in ways that actually inform the public health context, we're kind of missing the points, and it's also very difficult to to actually make uh, make any decisions. I'll give you some examples here. Um, so at WHO, uh, we had developed um, and uh, intentionally developed a different kind of an AI supported system for uh, classification detection of narratives regarding COVID nineteen and COVID nineteen vaccines, because actually um, out of the box tools 
aren't actionable for someone that is trying to make a rapid decision uh, on how to act on them. So, for example, what's pr the problem with the pervasive um, uh, classification of sentiment into positive and negative in health? Um, one, we imply that our goal is to make everyone on the internet happy about every health topic. And we know that in, in immunization, that's actually not the case. Um, computational tools will classify questions, concerns, or real concerns about an experienced uh, adverse event. They will classify it as negative. So, you know, these metrics don't actually tell me much about how to actually act on it. Same issue with reach metrics, same issue with hashtag, hashtag tracking that is built into most of the commercial and open, uh, open tools when, uh, when one uh, uses this. And the reason why these don't make sense is because they were built for commercial brand promotion. Um, I can go on and on and on how uh, promoting health is different than selling a product or service. <coughs> and uh, 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 not only about discrete uh, behaviors, but also the fact that this is a cyclical choice that is accumulative uh, for a person over the life course. And we need to be really careful how we actually use the computational uh, tools and the metrics in, uh, in this space. What's also very challenging is that um, most social media platforms are walled gardens. Uh, they take care of themselves really well. Their algorithms are very different. The way that Facebook chooses what a user is gonna see, uh, which is very much based on what your friends and your connections and groups see, it's very different than how TikTok is designed, which is designed basically on what goes viral and what is most interacted with. Uh, every single platform has a different business model. All of them actually uh, are optimized for advertising however they profile the user. But the issue is that, um, and then there's other issues that access to the data in order to be able to make any analysis has become even more restricted than um, before pandemic. Um, most of the analysis come from Twitter. Um, that's not the only platform, certainly not uh, the platform uh, nowadays that most people use. And uh, the issue is that the most interesting part of analysis of content online, which is boosted content, what advertisers pay to promote to people, which is actually probably the most effective content online on that particular platform, one cannot actually get the data to analyze that. So even things that the platforms um, give access to for research or to inform are quite restricted unless, uh, unless you end up uh, using the platform for commercial uh, promotion uh, or, and campaigning. Um, the other part is information environment changes a lot. And because we don't have really any data sharing and governance standards in place, it also means that, especially now, the last uh, eight, nine months, um, it's extremely difficult to do any research in social media. Uh, there's, um, but, we know that actually uh, information sharing to digital channels is really important. And I'll show you later what some alternatives are while we're trying to figure out how access to data, et cetera, is gonna, is gonna go. Um, one other thing, um, we all want to have the best data possible for decision-making. That's like gold standard best evidence in public health and, and in other sciences. But actually when it comes to reacting to information environment challenges, especially during an emergency, any data that's older than three weeks, really not that useful. So the this, this, this speed and the need for speed and rapid insights is something that um, was, was a, a huge emphasis of the work um, in the infodemic management community globally uh, in the last three years. Um, and at the same time, we know that uh, subnational population community specific data are literally what's needed. Uh, many people, uh, many uh, speakers before me actually mentioned uh, the local. We need to understand the local, um, um, uh, not just <laughs> um, uh, the local attitudes and epidemiological situation, but actually also the information ecosystem that people in certain communities uh, are exposed to. So, infodemic insights 
um, social listening insights have actually become more routinized and produced. Uh, you have here examples from UNICEF and uh, African Infodemic Response Alliance that's hosted uh, by WHO. Um, here's, I think, uh, South Africa and uh, the US, one of the vaccine competence insights reports that uh, Chris mentioned. So during the last three years, it's become more accepted that we need to have social listening reports. But uh, what we have learned is that we need to have actually um, really uh, put a lot of effort into uh, changing what we consider as good evidence in social listening reports. Um, we, uh, a lot of the social listening reports that you might see produced are descriptive, but they don't answer the question, how is something changing? So the directionality. They don't answer with what speed is it changing? Is it really going viral? And it doesn't, uh, they don't describe the context. Who is talking about who uh, regarding what? And um, those are the pieces that one needs. If you want to have an actionable insight, that's the type of analysis you need. Commercial platforms don't do this for you. And this is where a lot of innovation is needed. The second thing is that in order to, just like any other public health evidence uh, generation, we need to actually have um, a reproducible and systematic approach to, to evidence generation when it comes to describing the information environment. And that means uh, assessing data sources uh, for quality and relevance and really institutionalizing SOPs, because otherwise, um, going on online, looking at Twitter or on a Facebook uh, uh, dashboards and then base, uh, and making some kind of reports. Some people are speaking about X, uh, others are speaking about Y. It's literally a personal opinion of, of an analyst unless the analyst can actually demonstrate how they got there and uh, from what data sources. And the third piece is that um, just like anything in public health, we need to aim the insights to action, which means that the insights need to be produced based on a risk assessment. So we need to be clear, what are we talking about? What kind of uh, narrative is, um, uh, uh, is uh, posing what kind of a risk within the, within the domain and the control of uh, the health authority that's doing this? So like Liz mentioned, many narratives, fun they may be that we can describe and, and discuss um, um, political or religious or conspiracy theories narratives, very little that the health authority directly can do about it. Um, so we one needs to really um, look at um, the establishing this criteria. So what's the solution for this? Um, one of the tools that came out this summer um, in collaboration between uh, WHO Infodemic Management Team and Surani's uh, team at UNICEF um, Liz and I let uh, its, its, its writing and consultations is this uh, tool, uh, toolkit in uh, how to build an infodemic insights report in six steps. It's extremely practical and it's basically geared for people that need to do this research. But if you actually take a look into the manual, um, it makes sense to anyone that has worked in public health and triangulated data. Uh, what kind of challenges can infodemic insights address? Um, and here's the catch. Um, because they are geared to be uh, produced very fast, um, looking at all of the data sets that are available that can give you insights into how people are either searching, using uh, information, or what kind of behaviors uh, uh, um, uh, you can detect downstream in the health system, they actually can help you rapidly get uh, insight into basically almost any topic where you have a health guidance and you have a population that isn't adhering or it isn't, uh, um, um, uh, its health behaviors are not aligned with what the recommendations are. Uh, this means that it's not only related to infectious disease and outbreaks, but the same methodology can be used for basically any public health uh, question. Uh, insights can also help you monitor changes of conversations and sentiment. We can go a lot into what the sentiment measures should be. 
Um, it can help you investigate anecdotal evidence of misinformation. There's so many times that uh, when I spoke with colleagues in countries during COVID, where their boss basically just came to them and was like, okay, I just got this piece of misinformation forwarded, what should we do about it? But there was no, uh, so the first thing one, one would need to do, and this is what we were training people in, in global infodemic manager trainings, well, how do you even investigate if this is a problem? And where is it circulating? <laughs> and should we even do something about it? Um, and then prepare uh, the analyst to how to discuss with the boss that, you know, what to do or not, or probably not do in, in whatever uh, case. It's also really important to understand uh, information seeking behaviors of individuals, because actually when people are actively seeking, they will also use the information they come across. And if we're not proactive enough in providing this information, so this is filling in the information words, um, we're just uh, losing the opportunity uh, to do even the basic, uh, uh, to be more even uh, uh, more effective in our communication, even in the basic uh, uh, basic um, uh, actions. Um, the reason why I think it would be uh, it would be interesting for you to to read through the reports. Um, it's actually very practical and fun to read. I would say very well developed, but um, it does describe the process of how to uh, choose data sources, how to integrate the data, etc. But it has additional handouts specifically for information environment investigations uh, in, for example, zero dose communities zero those children, uh, polio applications and how you do this for seasonal influenza, vaccine safety events, even mass gatherings. Um, and uh, this means that it's actually already available out of the box for quite a lot of um, applications when it comes to immunization programs and also um, uh, emergency preparedness. Um, one thing, and I will not discuss this at length, but um, I think, um, um, I heard yesterday, you know, actually one of the biggest problems for infodemic manager that there's a ton of data out there, but it's not used. And there's all, and there's a, a lot of times an assumption that there just not, isn't enough information about what people's, uh, either people's concer uh, con questions, concerns, narratives that are circulating in a particular population are, or for example, health behaviors downstream that would actually help you uh, understand, well, what are people actually then acting on? Even though you cannot actually make the link, it gives you a rapid snapshot of what the population community that you're working with uh, might be thinking and what they're doing uh, on this. So one other thing that uh, is discussed at length is how do you go about and actually define the risk matrix for narratives? This is very important as well. It's, it's actually contextualized. Uh, so while it presents a frame, uh, the, uh, the, the manual presents a frame, um, it does need to be contextualized to the local immunization program, health promotion program, Ministry of Health at national level, whatever it is, but it gives some uh, instructions there. And as you might see, um, um, it, it, it's a function, the risk is a function of not only the spread and the velocity, but also the degree of, of impact uh, on, on uh, people's health. Uh, so if you have evidence that certain narratives are starting to impact negatively people's health behaviors, that for example, would be a high risk, uh, high risk uh, narrative. Another thing, um, and this is uh, uh, in conclusion, um, why am I talking about this is because um, there's um, often a perception that um, the infodemic um, and infodemic management is all about improving communications. Now, while uh, it definitely can help um, target and improve uh, health information, uh, the type of content uh, and address information voids, actually, when you're doing a systematic collection of what people are thinking and feeling about what, you, what the health system is doing, what your health program is doing, you actually find out a lot more than, than just their questions and concerns that can, be, uh, that can be addressed through communication. A lot of times you may find out that people may be complaining or expressing uh, concerns about um, 
I don't know, uh, the distance to the, to the uh, health clinic, or um, you might end up um, uh, picking up concerns in a particular community of um, um, misdiagnosis, like during uh, MPOX outbreaks, we easily six weeks before this ever came up in epidemiological analysis, we picked up uh, concerns and reports uh, from uh, uh, cis, um, cisgender women and trans people on misdiagnosis of MPOX, um, uh, et cetera, which all of these areas can actually, of a program, can actually be improved through the insights, which, and this is why I'm emphasizing that social listening, if done right, done systematically, done through uh, data sources that are triangulated properly, that is systematic, reproducible, it, it needs to be a part of the regular health program decisions on not just how the communications and community engagement is developed, but also um, how we better make sure that our health guidance is not confusing and how, um, how we perhaps may need to improve governance and collaboration with some other agency in the country that is responsible for health information uh, or deal with the fact that we need to address some uh, health service access supply or delivery issues that, that we didn't detect through anything else. But um, it's really, really important to see, um, uh, seek um, systematic way of um, understanding and helping, uh, understanding what community feels, thinks, uh, and does uh, in order to actually rapidly address this. Um, other tools that might be helpful in order to address some of the challenges that, that I was describing regarding data access is um, uh, there's other ways of understanding what, uh, what the community, um, uh, uh, what, what might be particular drivers um, of, of community uh, behaviors or what uh, attitudes, uh, uh, what their attitudes are, for example, um, on a particular topic. So CDC has a very nice toolkit out on rapid community assessments that actually has an addition where you can ask additional questions specifically on information environment. Um, but when it comes to online investigations, um, uh, digital anthropology and dig digital ethnographic studies are actually really, really important, not only to research, but because they can be also interventions. Um, and um, it's not very sexy because I know that, and this is something that I was trying to advocate while I was at WHO, uh, digital anthropology is not sexy with donors because computational methods and AI, etc., I think is actually occupying a lot of space. But what I'm saying is that if we want to leverage the investment into the AI tools that, we, that, uh, that we're investing in, we need to make sure that we're developing them with the awareness of all of the shortcomings and, and applicability for public health that I, that I mentioned earlier. And in the end, human analyst is always needed for integration uh, of data and interpretation. So um, we will talk a little bit more uh, tomorrow about trust and infodemic management in the emergency. Uh, sorry, I was rushing because I think we're all tired and Catherine still has a, um, an exercise. But please feel free to uh, ask me about this. Um, I feel very passionate about this because um, as, a, as a trained economist and a health informatician, but basically having worked in public health basically all of my career, I actually feel that, that multidisciplinary approaches and solutions in public health are really important. But we need to make sure that they serve the decisions and the need of someone that's actually making the decision in the program. So when we were doing the work in infodemic management, we literally asked ourselves, what does the head of the health program need in order for them to feel confident that they can inform their job immediately better? And um, that's what we need to do with information environment work as well. Thank you.